Welcome back to episode 234 of the Purple Rain Podcast. Welcome back to episode 234 of the Purple Rain Podcast, the uh, the Keaton Mitchell episode of the Purple Rain Podcast. You know, pretty good timing there. Uh, the Anthony Averett for one year episode, the uh, the Corey Ross, the Lorenzo Taliaferro, and Alex Collins episode. May they rest in peace, great players. And I'm going to throw back the Ovi Mahaley episode of the Purple Rain Podcast. Yeah, I'm going to go back yeah. there. Yeah, throwing it back. Uh, but thank you for coming through to, to this episode. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram at the Purple Rain Podcast. You can follow this guy on Instagram on X at Sutton Death. You can follow this guy right here on X at Huddle It Up Films, or subscribe to him on YouTube at Huddle It Up Films. Follow me go. on X at Simply AS10, or on no, yeah, and on instagram at simply as 10 dot prod it's um, the x and twitter is really screwing me around but thank you for coming through on this thursday edition this friday eve edition of the purple rain podcast we have a special guest but i'm gonna ask you both how is your week going and how are you guys feeling jason i mean hey. you, you, you're the guest take it away hey i'm doing okay i was telling telling a lot of people i feel like a little bit more relaxed about the draft the hard work's done been doing a lot of staring at the board and adjusting names and that kind of thing, but I got a really good feel for it. So I'm excited about that and excited about the, the Kyle Van Noy signing made, made the day a little bit better, a little uh, question uh, answer right there. So yeah, I'm doing great. How about you, Sut? I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. Um, you know, the whole Kyle Van Noy signing was, I was excited about it. I can say I liked it. I can't necessarily say I loved it. And we'll get into a little bit more about that in just a few minutes here. But I'm doing even better because this is our first episode of the Purple Rain podcast in 2024, where we are going to be officially and intentionally covering the NFL draft for 2024. And that's why we have our guy Huddle It Up Films, a.k.a. Jason. He is one of the be- one of the best in the business in this community at covering the draft. He's been doing it for almost three decades, the entire Ravens existence. So I mean, we, we greatly appreciate what he's going to be able to offer us here on this episode. So make sure if you're watching right now, make sure you give a like to this video, subscribe to our channel and make sure you go over to Huddle It Up Films on YouTube as well, because he's putting out great content over there. Just put out a video actually earlier today with uh, Coach 20, All 22 Films, Coach DC, um, basically covering draft and the priorities and kind of a lot of the things we're going to get into today, but they go into a really, really great detail on that video. So make sure you guys check that one out. I watched it myself earlier today. Awesome stuff. But again, Jason, we just want to thank you so much for uh, having you on. Man, no problem. I'm I'm happy to be here. Uh, uh, Thankful you guys have me on a couple times a year, it seems like. And uh, this is, yeah, you said almost three decades. This is where I come in handy. This is where it helps to know me, the draft. So if there's any time to uh, have me on, it's this time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And again, we appreciate it. And we would be remiss if we did not give a shout out to our sponsor, Manscaped. I was tweeting about Manscaped yesterday about that Beard Hedger, one of the greatest products they've ever put out. Um, still to this day, it's about a year and a half old now, but still one of the greatest products they've ever put out. So make sure you go ahead and cop that. Also, other really cool products like the Lawnmower 4.0. They've got the Shed, which you know keeps all your stuff right in a nice little carrying case it's for travel. Things like that is awesome. Make sure you use our code PRP. That's going to get you 20% off plus free international shipping off your entire order. You guys know the drill. All right. Getting past that, you know, the housekeeping things. I want to bring up who's here in the live chat. We got Dre in here. Says, what's up, Purple Rain Gang? What's going on, Dre? Appreciate you for coming through. Tanja Bowman giving a shout out to Huddle It Up Films. Says, hey, Jason, what's going on? Um, We got Don Royal in the house as well. Says, shout out to the Texans GM for knowing how to take care of your QB. Okay. I've seen some salty fans of some NFL franchises this week ever since the uh, the Texans went ahead and, of course, copped up on Stefan Diggs, which we will get into as well a little bit later. Uh, we got a couple of our mods in the chat as well. Black Daniels is in the house. What's going on, Black Daniels? Appreciate you saying give this, give this video a like. Also, you know, turn on the notifications. If you don't have notifications on for mm-hmm. PRP, turn them on. You guys know we go live at least twice a week. It's the thumbs up. 
leave the thumbs up, hit the noti. That way you'll be notified whenever we do go live or when we post a new video. There's also YouTube shorts that come out as well throughout the week. So make sure you stay in tune for that. I see. Mod Boz. Mod Boz, one of my favorite mods. Sure. It says Rain Gang. Hope nice. you're having a blessed week. Boz is he's he's one of the he's one of the he's one he's of, one like of the, kind. the uh yeah. he is. He is. Because there's not very many Ravens live stream podcasts, whatever you want to call it, that are going to have a Steelers fan as a moderator in the chat. Um, he's he's one of the, he's one of the, our biggest trolls, but he always keeps it classy, and that's what we appreciate for it's uh, in good jest with Boz. Yeah, it's always in good in good faith. So we we love you, Boz. We appreciate you, and um, yeah, thank you for being our moderator along with Black Daniels. Like okay. I said, let me see if we have any more mods in here as well. I was looking for Cal. Cal, I was actually just having a conversation with the other day. She'll probably trickle in here, here at some point. Let me I see. see. We got I Lisa. See the dog as well. Oh, I see K Dog. Let me give a the shout out to Lisa. Lisa says, Hey, Alex and Sudden Death, could you please be so kind as and hugs Baltimore way uh, because of the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse last Tuesday morning? Absolutely. Um, yes. I don't think we, we covered it on the last episode of the show, but yeah, I mean, definitely prayers up to anybody who was impacted by. That horrible, you know, incident that happened last week, uh, you know, words can't even describe what somebody would be feeling after that, you know, family members, people just impacted people just who live in the area in general. Um, I know a, a lot of our viewers, you know, uh, our guests, Jason, I know you're yeah, close man. by the area as well. It's It's been tough. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was just, uh, I mean, obviously the outcome was, was tragic and is tragic, but, uh, going through it from my perspective was pretty scary too. Like we, we didn't really know what was going on. We just knew something was going on for a solid 10, 15 minutes talking about it felt like the house was going to collapse type like blue angels flying overhead. It felt like an airplane. It was a buildup noise. And then everybody was poking their heads out at their house at one thirty in the morning. Like what the heck's going on out there? And we all started coming out saw the video they had it on community facebook within like 10 15 minutes the video of it and then uh you know the wife and i walked down to the water and uh you know i live right here the when i tell you i go by walk, walks at nighttime by the water that's by water so helicopter already flying and all that other stuff and it's you know i mean it's an inconvenience for most of us is put up you know if i want to go that way i can't anymore but um you know people went to work and didn't come home and uh you know, people were in that water trying to save other people. And then just being around all that, it was a, it was a heavy experience, man. Like I said, the, the most I was affected is just the inconvenience. And of course the sentimental value of the bridge, people losing their jobs and, and losing their lives is a lot more important, but it was, it was scary just from being around here. You could tell something, it was something weird happened and you, you know, it wasn't an earthquake, but it wasn't a plane, but it sounded like a plane what's going on. So um, yeah, I'm right down here in Dundalk, you know, on the water. So, I was right in my backyard and then, you know, going down the street, can't go down the street without CNN. And, you know, I mean, Lester Holtz on Dunlock Avenue for Pete's sake. It was, it was weird, bro. It was like twilight zone. Great way to put it. Yeah. I mean, twilight zone. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, crazy being from, you know, Maryland and then going on it as well. Like you said, um, pairs up, you know, sucks that what was four people that they couldn't find. Six. Well, yeah, four they couldn't find. Oh, yeah, six. six, I thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like you said, four people that didn't go home to their families and the countless jobs, you know, people that are, it, it's crazy to think. I mean, it happened here, you know, when you're not used to Baltimore being that main center of attraction. But I couldn't imagine, in your perspective, you know, can't even go down the street without just seeing that. Yeah, it's not there, bro. It's just weird. It's just, you know, as a lifelong resident, it's just wild that it's not there. Like that, that was the thing. I saw the video of it and I was like, I still couldn't believe that's why I went down there. It was like human nature just to, are we sure this is, you know what I mean? And just yeah, to not surreal. see it there was, 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 was weird, dude. Yeah, I felt like I don't even know why I was down there. I just felt like I needed to. And then, yeah. of course, came back to Twitter and saw the mess of the people going back and forth already bringing up politics from whatever side. And it was just that part of it was disheartening, but um, you know, and the, you know, all the other stuff I ain't going to get into, it was just don't call for it. But, uh, but yeah, man, people lost their lives. People lost their jobs. Um, you know, we kind of lost a landmark and something that was people that aren't from here. Don't understand it. would be like, Oh, well, it's just a bridge. It was, yeah, I understand that. But it was just like part, a part of our life since I was a little kid. 
you know, going down the beach. If I'm going down anywhere south of here, I, I take that's where I take, you know. So uh, it's still pretty wild. Uh, what almost two weeks later? I don't even really know if it's a week and a half or however long. It it still yeah. seems like yesterday. Yeah, definitely a um, just a tough experience all around for those involved. Obviously, for those around in the community, it's. It, and it, of course, it echoed throughout the entire nation, it, literally yeah. overnight, literally overnight. And it's, again, just sending hugs, like Lisa says here, sending hugs, we're sending prayers, you know, to anybody who needs it. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, stay in Baltimore strong. That's that's what we got to do. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, I do see Mod K Dog in the chat says, smash that damn like button. It's free. Okay. It is free. I mean, he's speaking facts. It's free and it helps these guys out a ton. It does. He's also speaking facts there. Thank you. Um, he says, yeah, give us a like. New intro as well. Y'all saw the new intro. Uh, man, <sighs> shout out to our guy, Simply AS10. He, he he promised us a new intro. He delivered on that I promise. I was late. I was late. No more, you it's know, soft. listen. I wish we could have kept Mr. Mr. Queen in there. Uh, unfortunately, man, I like, couldn't. And now I have Ba sending me shark emojis every here and here and there so you know kind of had to throw it back with some people on there you know some old players but that's the ravens good back then good now we're a winning franchise what can i say it's nice yeah yeah uh okay let me see we got cam the baptist cam is in here as well what's going on cam a purple rain pioneer himself he's been here for a minute um, okay. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get into what we came here to talk about, right? We're already 12 minutes into the video. Uh, we got to get talk. into some, some, some football, some ball talk. Exactly. We got to get into some ball talk. Shout out to Tanja again. All right. So we want to lead with this, right? So today we found out that Kyle Van Noy, Kyle Van Noy, uh, Ravens edge rusher from 2023, 2024 season. He re-signed with the Baltimore Ravens for a two year deal. That's worth up to what? 10 or $11 million. I want to say, uh, <clears throat> I guess I'll start off with my take on this and what I thought, my initial reaction, my knee-jerk reaction, if you will. I liked it. I didn't love it. The reason why I liked it, of course, nine sacks last season. And how many games, Alex? How many games did he start? 14. 14. Oh, it's nine sacks in 14 games. Didn't even play the whole season. Obviously, he's on the back half of his career. That's pretty damn impressive. I will not lie there. But I will say this as well. I'm looking around the AFC North and all the other pass rushers and all the other pass rush talent that they have, whether it be a Miles Garrett, whether that be a TJ Watt, um, Hightower, you know, just all these guys around the, uh, the division. These guys are game wreckers in a lot of different ways. I don't see it. And let me know. You guys jump in. Feel free to jump in. Let me know if I'm wrong here. I don't really see Kyle Van Noy as being a game wrecker for our pass rushing group going forward. And I think, I think that this is the Ravens kind of surrendering or, you know, just kind of letting us know that, okay, there's going to be a regression at pass rush this season. I think that we had a really good season last year in terms of production and sacks. But, of course, losing a Jadavion Clowney, who was a huge part of that, is going to put a damper on things. So, again, I don't love it. I would have – I think I would have rathered us put the money elsewhere and rely on the young guys because I feel like regardless, it, like I said, it, there's going to be – a a back step in the production numbers when it comes to sacks. That's why I say I liked it, but I don't love it. Now, another reason I did like it, because Kyle Van Noy, he offered a lot of that veteran presence in the locker room last season. I remember when we were kind of um, on that final stretch in the, at the end of the regular season, you know, he was kind of the one in the locker room after wins, kind of speaking up to the team, like, hey, guys, look, I've been here before. We can do this. This is what we need to do. This is where our heads need to be at. And I thought that that was so valuable to a lot of those young guys in the locker room. And I think it will still continue to be going forward. Uh, but in terms of on the field production, the Ravens just still are on the hunt for that killer at edge rusher. And I have kind of like a, a theory on what might what might be a uh, a solution for this for this void. But I want to first hear you guys' takes on mm. Kyle Van Noy re-signing with the Ravens. Alex, we'll go to you first, and then we'll go down to our guy Jason. Okay. So from what you just said, you just made me think of something. You basically just mm -hmm. said the Anthony Edwards statement. They have KD, but we got Jaden McDaniels. That's basically what I heard from you. You know, they got Miles Garrett. They got TJ Watt, but we got Kyle Van Noy. And you are right there. You are right there. But it does fill a, a major void. I do love it, number one. Uh, mm -hmm. Jadavion Clowney got two years, 20 mil. 
He's 31 years old, had nine and a half sacks last year. Pop Inouye, 33 years old, two year, 10 mil, nine sacks last year, three less games. So I'm happy with the price. I'm happy with the production, happy with the leadership. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not mad at this at all. I felt like he's gonna ask for more. To be honest, I felt like that's why he was still a free agent. He was asking for a lot of money. I'm not mad at it at all. Uh, you know, he came in immediately. First game had a, a nice pass deflection. Took him a couple of games. Got his first couple of sacks. Was taking over drives. Uh, the Seahawks final drive in the first half of that game. It took over back to back sacks and the forced fumble. Gets him out of field goal range. Uh, and then he had a couple as well against the Lions. So I do love it. Um, he's a dog and he's a leader and it makes me feel good about this edge rushing group. You know, we still need one more person, but we've shown that we can get some production in August, go back to Justin Houston. And then even last year with Clowney. So I love it. Uh, that's my final thoughts. And I think we're on the same page about who could really help us out as that X factor Sutton. I know who you're talking about. I'm right there with you, but I'll, uh, I'll hand it off to Jason. Okay. Yeah. I really like the move. Are we talking about Judon by any chance, Matt Judon? I was talking about Judon. I'm gonna I'm just say I was talking about. So was I. I mean, you know, I'm glad we're all on the same page here. Go see, ahead, Jason. It's, it's it's hard to you know for the people that uh, knock Judon. I would say he played four games last year. He got an injury to his uh, pec, so it's not like he got his knee blown out. And it's going to take him a while. He's going to be fine. He had four sacks in four games last year. I think he had twelve and a half or thirteen and a half the year before. So. Judon can rush the passer. He showed that as soon as he left Wink's system where he was dropping in coverage a lot and was allowed to rush the passer. As far as Van Noy, I really like it. I really like it for a couple of reasons. I did not want to spend big money on defense. I really feel like we need to invest in the offense. But at the same time, I felt like we needed a veteran presence in that edge rusher room. In other words, I didn't want to go into the season with a Jabo, who we still don't know what we have, a Way still trying to really find his place in the league. Tavius Robinson, you know, still very green, not a pass rushing prospect, really more of an edge rusher. And then draft another rookie. Like, to me, that would have seemed like too much unprovenness in that room. So to add somebody like Kyle Van Noy, who you know you're going to get good run defense, you can put him on either side. He can play Sam. He can drop into coverage. Uh, he blows up screen plays. He anticipates it. Good intelligence. Uh, taking on pullers and he'll get you some pass rush. No, he's, he's not of course like miles Garrett or TJ Watt, but he'll at least provide some steadiness. And why I like this guys is like, I'm a, I'm one of those guys who I've been a little pessimistic on a Daffy away, but I'm more of an Ajabo fan because I've seen the natural pass rush that he's got uh, the strip sacks. He's already gotten strip sacks. Uh, he's only played what, like four games or something like that already has two strip sacks. He's a natural when it comes to rushing the passer. So, Let's say Ajabo is healthy and he's racking up the sacks. Well, you didn't spend sixteen million on a pass rusher that you're that's going to be sharing time with him. You can let Ajabo eat, but if Ajabo never progresses or if he's hurt again, you have a veteran that you know what you get. So, I guess that's my. my I, I really like the fit. I wouldn't want to go into the draft trying to add another young guy to add to a bunch of young guys. Yeah, yeah, on the head. Yeah, I mean, I I like that and. Uh... <laughs> Tanja Bowman says here, we were all talking about Judon. We will take him. I, man, I, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. And I honestly think that Judon wants to be back in Baltimore. I remember I went to a uh, I went to a Ravens game last year. It was against the Rams. You guys know that that rain game where they pull out the, the victory in overtime. Um, come to find out after I leave the game, Judon was literally right by the stadium. I think he was doing something with uh, Jimmy's seafood or something like that. And, mm. and he was taking pictures with the fans and things like that. I'm like, you know, like this guy must really love Baltimore, you know? And obviously uh, last year we were literally living life on a hundred because we, the Ravens were just doing so well. And I think that bringing him back would, would definitely bolster this uh this this edge rushing group and he would be able to teach the young guys and also be able to provide that production at the very same time and i think for a good price to be honest with you uh man the more i talk about it the more i actually want to see it happen but i know that that it, yeah mm, mm, alex why are we talking about this man because now now i'm going to be thinking you about like it for the hurt. next few days I, yeah i don't mean. i don't like to get hurt i mean that's just Mm. We can hey, we can give Kyle his I mean, flowers. Kyle's a good player. We got Kyle yes. on the cheap, dude. His cap hit's probably only going to be like three million this year. 
you spread it out. Like we got them for pretty much for free uh, to get a veteran in that room. So we'll, we'll quell our Judon once by just being happy. We got, we got Kyle for next to nothing. You're right. You're right. You're right. We we, we, we should be happy with Kyle. Van Noy and Judon know each other. They both played together. Did Judon play with Zach Gore in 2016? I'm I'm just trying to tell y'all something. This is sounding more and more sweet. The more we talk about it, I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm fully on that train, though. So, again, I wanted to preface this episode by kind of talking um, about Kyle Van Noy because that is the biggest news. But here's what we came here to talk about tonight, right? The draft is in just a couple of weeks. And, you know, we've got our guy, Jason, here to give us his expertise on uh, the NFL draft because he's been doing this for for years and years now, literally since the, the Ravens uh, came to fruition back in the 90s. He's been covering them. And it's mind-blowing to me watching his videos and things like that how much knowledge this guy has on all these college athletes on top of keeping up what's going on in the nfl man i mean that is uh, first of all just hats off to you on that one because i i don't i don't i don't have the skill i don't have the uh the attention span to really do the deep dive on all these guys and you know that's that's why we have you on so again we appreciate you for coming on and um yeah i know the rain gang will appreciate your expertise on these on these topics uh so Here's where we're going to start. We're going to start on laying out our priorities for this upcoming draft for the Ravens. Um, a lot of people might think that, you know, it's a popular opinion that the Ravens are going to go uh, offensive lineman first, which I think would be the best scenario, to be honest. Uh, but I'll, I'll go out and I'll list mine first. So I'm going to go offensive lineman as my top priority. Obviously, you know, having Tyler Linderbaum as the only solid piece there that we know is going to be there for the foreseeable future. It definitely leaves me a little bit unsettled, obviously, with uh, Kevin Zeitler, who's a lion now, uh, Morgan Moses, who's out of town. And we've got Ronnie Stanley, who we don't know if he's going to be the Ronnie Stanley of old. I mean, in the past couple of seasons when he has been healthy, he's been up and down. Uh, and for all that money that he's making, that is kind of disheartening, to say the least, uh, especially because he's protecting Lamar Jackson's blind side. So I think that offensive line is by far the the biggest most glaring need on this ravens team right and uh i'm gonna go with for my second priority i'm gonna go with uh this is this is where it gets a little tough right this is where it gets a little tough because you can go i think one of two ways i would probably go i'd probably go db i'd probably go db as my second priority and the only reason i say that is when we're talking about big, heavy contracts, and uh, Jason, you brought this up in, in one of your last episodes of your show. When you're talking about big contracts like we have with uh, Ronnie Stanley as well, Marlon Humphrey is another guy who's on a big contract. And, you know, he's not going to be here in the future once Lamar Jackson's uh, cap hit decides to go up and up and up these these next couple of seasons. Right. So I think that now is the time, especially with our Super Bowl window being where it is. I'm not going to say that it is closing but i think it is a little bit smaller than it was going into last season um but i'm gonna go with db as my as my second priority there and then my third priority i'm gonna go with a wide receiver now it is also my understanding that this draft is full of wide receivers uh to choose from uh so obviously i want jason to kind of take it away with that um when we get to talking about the receivers but those are my top three priorities but jason i want to come to you next on this one like what are your top three priorities for this draft for the Ravens and why I almost want to cheat a little bit and double up and say, number one, an offensive tackle, number two, an offensive tackle who could maybe play guard this year. And then number three, try to figure out whether we want a corner or a wide receiver or out, how really to slice that, because I don't know. I, I look at the line, like you said, so not, it just, it just doesn't sit right with me. The title and the bomb is the only person that I can assess what he's going to do this year with confidence. You know, he's going to be a good player. File Lele, I, you know, I'm up and down with him. I, I haven't seen him consistently put together snaps. I think speed rushers will give him problems. He still has problems getting out of his stance. Who knows? Maybe he's lost some weight. Maybe he's ready to take that next step. Ben Cleveland, I think, is going to be okay. Um, Alex, plenty of cut-ups on my channel. I know that you've we've talked about this before. It's hard to find a game where Ben Cleveland played bad. You know, he, he plays a pretty decent. I just don't feel comfortable with a new right tackle, new right guard when the right side of our line was our strength last year. And then, of course, Andrew Voorhees has never played an NFL snap. Uh, Just remember, Voorhees started college in 2017. 
So he started college seven years ago and has battled injuries throughout. Um, so you don't know what you're getting from Voorhees. I think we're getting pretty good play from Cleveland, but not having a veteran Morgan Moses next to him is makes that a little more sketchy. So, you know, my friend, I would love to see the Ravens just rebuild this offensive line because my philosophy is, uh, Alex, I'll kick it to you on this. You pre- protect Lamar that's and provide running legs for Derek, Derek Henry. You get that, that, that good offensive line. Things st- uh, tend to take care of themselves from there. You don't want to get your quarterback banged up. You don't want your quarterback running for his life and just even getting tired within games. You know what I mean? Getting tired, getting fatigued, forget about getting hurt. And you want Derrick Henry to be effective. All that, I feel like, just take care of the line. Everything will take care of itself. That right there is nail on the head. And I'm right there with you. Um, line, obviously, number one, tackle and guard, because I'm also looking at life after Ronnie Stanley as well. I think, isn't this his last year? The way they, they messed around with his contract, it could be his last year. So right, he's got a void year, void year next year. So it's just like the Odell situation from this past season. So you have to think life after him. Who is protecting Lamar's blind side? You know, we don't know. And you know, we ship off Moses and we'll have a right tackle. You know, Makari can play basically anywhere on the line, but I don't know how I feel about that. And you bring up Falele. I'm not his number one fan, I'll be honest. But guys in year three with the the Ravens somehow make this crazy step. We've seen it with multiple players. Hopefully he's the next one. And then guard, you know, you don't know who's going to be there. Um, so I don't care who, uh, tackle or guard, I'm happy with line. And uh, I know it's not going to be the one, like Zay Flowers last year, like we can sit here and drool over him, you know, these big plays, making people miss, burning defenses. But as long as we keep Lamar up and healthy, I'll say it, we're going to be a 10-11 team. Uh, no matter who's that wide receiver, we've seen it before, and he'll do it again. So keep him up and healthy, and who knows? We can get a receiver. We've talked about guys, me and Jason, who can come with this team from the draft and, and make an impact. So, yeah, 100% tack or guard. Um, we have a our just our piece in Linderbaum who we know will be here for multiple years, seven, eight years, hopefully more. But, yeah, keep, keep the great wall of Lamar up. And Sutton, I'm going to kick it to you on this. I remember talking to you guys a, a while back, like right after the season ended and, and saying stuff on Twitter. Like, I don't think I've ever seen a, a tackle class like this. Like, and I'm, I'm being serious. I remember Eric DaCosta in this press conference said, well, I'm not going to call it historic, but it, and I'm like, man, he would know better than me, but it looks pretty historic to me. Like usually there's two or three tackles. They go in the top 10, 15, and then everybody else is like a shot in the dark. Maybe you get a Michael Orr type prospect at the end where all right he projects as a pretty good right tackle this draft you're looking at like the vegas over unders is is like 10 10 and a half offensive linemen to go in the first round like one out of every three picks so uh, something what i'm saying is this is a rare year where you could pick at 30 and get yourself a starting left tackle like how insane is that i think the ravens would be best suited even if they got to trade up a couple of spots to make sure they get that left tackle get them in the program for a year get them ready to take over for Ronnie when that happens. Yeah, honestly, I mean, the draft, this year's draft for the Ravens should be like Christmas for Joe D, the Ravens offensive line coach, to be honest. He, he should be completely filled up with I me. Mean, offensive tackle, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking some guards get thrown in there. But, Jason, you brought up a really good point about um our offseason acquisition of Derrick Henry and the importance of kind of feeding the line and make sure that we can maximize the production that we get from a Derrick Henry because – you know, we've seen Derrick Henry behind a bad offensive line before in Tennessee, and there were a lot of plays where he's running between the tackles and he gets chopped down really early, you know, because we're not getting any push up. For, well, not us, but the Titans weren't getting any good push up front, you know. So I think that that's something that we really, really have to invest in in order to get our return on investment on a Derrick Henry. So I think that's a fabulous point. Now, uh, I want to get into some of the names, right, because you mentioned that there's a ton of offensive linemen, right, who are available for uh, in the first round, just in general, like top tier guys. A couple of names that, that have, you know, I've been kind of hearing around the town lately in terms of realistic guys who the Ravens could possibly get and, you know, guys who could fall to them. Amarius uh, Mims is one of them. Um, I believe uh, J.C. Latham out of uh, was Alabama, I want to say. He's another yeah. guy. Uh, was it? I think I heard about Blake Fisher as well. Uh, I could be wrong. I think he might be a little bit further down. And but there's a lot of there's just so many guys, like you said. So 
Jason, I want to give it to you. Who are some guys that the Ravens can realistically expect to pick up at offensive linemen in that first round? Who's going to be available Absolutely. for? Us? Absolutely. So just to go over the the, the depth and real quickly, Joe Alt's going to be gone. Uh, yeah. Although Fashionu is going to be gone, Talisi Fuaga is going to be gone, um, and probably a guy that the Ravens had in for a visit, Troy Fontanu, is probably going to be gone. So there's there's four guys right off the top. J.C. Latham, I would expect to be gone. I mean, he's from Alabama, number one. Uh, he's just turned 21 years old. He's got a rare body type, guys, 6'6", 340, but he moves like a man that's much, much lighter. Long, long arms, playing in the SEC. Uh, excellent, like, plug-and-play right tackle, great run blocker, um, and he maybe even could play on the left side. So I think those – if I had to guess, I would say those five guys will be gone, but you never know. After that is where it gets interesting. And on my board, the guy that I have next is Tyler Guyton. Uh, fun homework assignment for you. Uh, if you type in Tyler Guyton touchdown, I guarantee you on YouTube it'll have it. He's a converted tight end. So if you want to see the big 6'8", now right tackle prospect slash left tackle prospect, catch a touchdown in the back of the end zone and show off his athleticism. Uh, that's the kind of guy that you get with him. Easily mirrors pass rusher Tyler Guyton. You know, the the worry with him is he's just a little bit green. It might take him a year or, you know, maybe a year to where you're getting good tackle play. But an excellent prospect, body control, all of that uh, excellent prospect. And then the guy you brought up, Sut, are Marius Mims out of Georgia. Uh, one of the, I think there's a good chance that he could be there because he only has eight starts and there's some injury uh, history in his background. So you're looking at a great product um, as far as like if he had played for two years, started for two years, was healthy, had two seasons under his belt, he would be up there with the Joe Waltz and the, and the fashion news and those kind of guys. But he just doesn't. He's got inexperience. So that inexperience plus what the medicals look like uh, may drop our Marius Mims to, to us. And there's one other name, believe it or not, uh, two other names, actually. Jordan Morgan, uh, he's a left tackle for Arizona. You could see him go up against the pass rusher Latu and pretty much handle him the entire game. Uh, extremely good athlete. Uh, looks a little bit like Ronnie Stanley. He's just smaller, but the good Ronnie Stanley, who had the excellent body control, could make any run block, handle any type of pass block. And then there's a guy called uh, named Graham Barton out of Duke. A lot of people think he'd be better off at guard or center, but he's, other than Troy Fontano, the best left tackle tape in the uh in the land and he's a guy you could plug right in at left guard if you wanted to um just a very polished pass uh pass blocker so i mean geez that's not even getting to like some other guys who might not be who might be wild cards but that's what nine guys i just rattled off right there and that's why he's on here it's really that simple <laughs> you know how long it would take me to, to study those nine guys and give you a report like that the draft would have calman gone by that point this is our wow. guy Jason from Huddle It Up Films joining us here on the Purple Rain Podcast. Make sure you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel as well, and make sure you head over to Huddle It Up Films if you want to hear more draft breakdowns, draft content, things like that. He's got it over there on his channel, man. Like I said, he just put out a video today with Coach All-22 Films, Coach DC. Great stuff. Great stuff, man. Uh, Thank so, you. And also, I just wanted yeah. to say my big board is also over there and on my Twitter profile. So you can look yes. at how I ever have them ranked and um, – and that, that kind of thing. And uh, I'm going to move, mess with them until draft day, the draft week. But, um, but yeah, it also would give you a chance, a chance to see the kind of depth there at tackle. I can't remember a class like this. I mean, bro, I, I, I rattled off nine guys, 10 guys or whatever it is. Even if you're not a fan of two or three of those guys, you see what I'm saying? At pick 30, yeah. there's a good chance that a guy that any one of us really believe in will be there. So, yeah. And you know, that run of receivers is going to, so there's always that kind of couple of surprises in the first round. So like you said, there, there's very well a chance that they could be there. Now I want to ask you this because I've kind of been softening up to the idea uh, of us trading out of 30. I was talking to you last week about it. And if there's a plethora of guys there that we like, um, just kind of both of you, could you see us trading out of 30? And how would you feel about it? Well, yeah, before, before we toss it to Jason, I think absolutely. I, I, I do think that we could trade out of the first round because – from what I've gathered from all the draft content that I've uh, that I've consumed over the past couple of weeks, round two is going to be a gold mine. This draft is very, very deep at multiple positions, whether it be offensive line, whether it be uh, receiver. So it's, it's 
I could see it. And in years past, I would tell you no. Like, no, let's stick to our guns. Let's stay at this, you know, at our pick, our late first round pick, which is where we normally go. Um, but no, this year, I, I totally agree. I could see us trading out of the first round and I'd feel very comfortable in doing so if I knew that we could double up and get, you know, a couple of a couple of linemen. But there was a question that um, I want you to address that as well, Jason. But there was a question about guard. Uh, who's going to take Kevin Zeitler's spot? So yeah, that's uh, that's Ben Cleveland. That's Ben Cleveland, Lisa. Uh, they, if you remember, Lisa, he was kept out of that left guard competition last year, and then Week 18, or even in the preseason, and Week 18 versus the Steelers. And when Zeitler got some rest in garbage time, it was always Ben Cleveland coming in at right guard. So he's the presumptive starter at that spot. Yeah. Also, give a shout out to Yolanda. Says good evening, Rain Gang. Good to see Jason on the show. Absolutely. Thank Salute you to you, Yolanda. Thank you for coming through. Uh, but yeah, how, how are you feeling, though, Jason, on the Ravens potentially trading out of the first round and kind of stockpiling some more picks in the back half of the draft? You know, I, I think that the top 45 to 50 in this draft are about as strong as, as, as you get it. And I do think that there is a point where the prospects start to even out. Like, say, you know, everybody's going to be different. But between prospects like 25 on your list and 45 on your list, I think that there's not much difference, but I think there's an equal chance. I would hope that there's an equal chance that the Ravens would be willing to part with a third uh, to move up. I, if you go by the charts, it would take a third round pick to move up three, four spots and get that tackle that we want. Um, and the reason for that is, of course, we got a earlier fourth round pick for the Morgan Moses trade. So we, you know, it's only a pick 20 picks later than our third round pick. So that third round pick, I guess, uh, if we if it if it gets us our left tackle of the future, I'll be able to I'd be willing to part with pick ninety three in a heartbeat to get the next Ronnie Stanley on this roster. Um, but but yes, uh, I would say equal chance trade up, trade back, stick and pick. I think it just all depends on where's the run. You know how many of these offensive linemen go, how many of the receivers go, and and that kind of thing because it's it's really stacked at that. Also, it could be four quarterbacks, could be five quarterbacks. It could even be six quarterbacks picked before us. So we'll be rooting for quarterbacks uh, to go early and often on draft night. Yeah. And absolutely. Speaking of the run, like I've seen guys like Brian Thomas mocked 15. And I've seen the mock of the Ravens as well. Like it's, it's crazy how it can be a mid first or, you know, even a late first. So we don't know how it goes. You know, we try to predict it, but we're, we're never going to get a spot on. And like you said, with the quarterbacks as well, is there going to be a team that wants to trade back in to the first round and get that extra year of, of, uh, of control on them like we did with Lamar or, you know, have other teams have. So I've seen how Penix even, you know, they've been mocking teams to trade back in the 30, 31, 32. The draft team yeah. had that extra year of control, so we don't know. Yeah, Sutton, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm cool with trading back as long as we get a, a, a starting tackle. Like whatever we do to get is we got to get the starting tackle. If we can do that and trade back, I'm I'm cool with it. Get an extra pick, maybe move back up later or something like that. But just, just get that starting tackle. And as much as I would love to add another weapon for Lamar in the first round, I really feel like we gotta we gotta really up the game in the offensive line. Yeah, I mean mm. you, you're 100 percent right there. I mean there, there's no point. There's literally no point in going out and getting him another weapon if we do not have. Uh, time for him to throw the football to you know get the football to that weapon uh i've always said i've said it multiple times on this show your offensive line is literally like the foundation of a house nothing else can happen unless that foundation is there uh so another analogy i like to use is you got to eat dinner before dessert right like so it might be not as exciting right going for offensive linemen and you know guards and, and tackles early in the draft but it's it's what you need to make guys like zay flowers more productive it's what you need to make guys like derrick henry more productive uh rashad bateman another guy mark andrews isaiah likely who were you know nobody's really talking about even though he's coming off of a career year we need guys that are going to allow lamar jackson to get those guys the football and i think yeah. that's going to be the main focus in this draft for sure now i want to yeah. get to a couple of questions that i see down in the chat alex do you have something for us i'm sorry just one more thing. You can go back to our stream from two years ago when we traded Hollywood for Linderbaum. Obviously, I wasn't the, the happiest person because I loved Hollywood, but you look at it now, it was the right right move. I wasn't sitting here clicking my heels doing backflips for Linderbaum, but to you now, he, he's a damn good center that I would do that trade 10 times in, uh, in 10 again. So, you know, I mean, that's just the draft, and that's why these guys make the big bucks. And I would trust Mr. DeCosta and all the scouts with the draft. And, 
hello to this little pup. Welcome to the Purple Rain Podcast. <laughs> he's not so little. He's about 75 pounds. Uh, American Bulldog, but... <laughs> that's, that's a curl. You're right, you're right. But I do want to get to some uh, some questions here. I saw an interesting one because, again, we, we're talking a lot about offensive linemen. It's not the sexy thing to do, obviously, but, again, you, you got to get you got to get the dinner before dessert. But Captain Gamer says here, what are some day two or three wide receivers that have a chance to fall to us? Jason, take it away. Man, I tell you, that's the the evolution of the game right now. I, I want to just wonder if it goes back to so many kids playing flag football here where these kids are coming into college ready. They're coming into pros more ready. And there seems to be more and more young men come in ready to contribute right away at the wide receiver position. So there's a ton of them. Like I, I, I have 28 on my board. I probably could have had 35. I just figured I was going to cut it off at some point um, and really try to draw a hard line. But there, you know, Captain Gamer, it really depends on what style you're looking for because they all bring something different to the table. And that's the beauty of them. So you got your, your three horses at the top who could pretty much do it all. And then aside from that, they all specialize in something. So when I'm looking at the second round, I would say, can a guy uh, like Ricky Pearsall from Florida fall? Uh, excellent athlete, 4'3", 940, uh, excellent route runner. How far does Troy Franklin, who was a uh, first round lock for a while, but he didn't have the best offseason, uh, deep ball specialist, could he be there? You have a route runner like Roman Wilson out of Michigan. Didn't get a lot of opportunities because Michigan runs the ball a ton. Uh, but he is an excellent, excellent route runner, really good at finding space. And another guy who, you know, he's 5'11", but runs a 4'3'9". So you're talking about a slot C, slot receiver that would run a 4'3'9". And the guy that I'm really interested in that I've seen uh, kind of the Ravens fans uh, kind of want or either love or hate is Xavier Leggett. Xavier Leggett is built like DK Metcalf, like not exaggerating. He's just a little shorter. He's six foot, but he is rocked up and first time i looked at him guys i was like wait a minute why is this guy playing tight end like there's no way he's too stiff to like you know what i mean he just looks so bulky and then when you watch him you're like man this guy's pretty graceful then you see him get the ball and he's getting yak and he's making people miss uh another guy runs a 439 that's like the magic number in this compound so he's built like dk metcalf runs a 439 excellent with the ball in his hands He'll at least be able to do give you like the slants, the goes, and the gadgety stuff, and could develop into a route runner because people have to respect his speed. And I'm going to throw out three more names there: J Jermaine Burton. Uh, yeah. He went to Alabama. Fascinating player. I'm not sure. Like I didn't do any red flags this year, but there are some stuff behind the scenes. I actually, had fans charging the field, and he kind of uh, struck a female fan. Uh, you know, who was storming the field. So I don't know how that. Uh, would affect his draft status, but he he profiles as a guy that could be a starter. You have one of Steve Smith's favorites, Malachi Corley from Western Michigan. Uh, Mini Debo, there he is, Malachi Corley, the Yak King. Mini Debo, bro. Like the only thing you can knock him for is his competition because the guys that are chasing him are nothing like NFL athletes. But he's a converted running back, uh, and you can see that when he's got the ball in his hands, he is trying to fight for every single yard. And he's got excellent contact balance. Like a like a, a Ray Rice from the past, where you could square him up, and he just absorbs it with his big body and is able to keep his balance. And then another interesting guy I'll throw out there, another LSU receiver, Jalen Polk. I think he's got some of the best hands in the draft. And uh, excuse me, he's from Washington. Michael Penix would launch some footballs down the field, 50, 60 yard bombs, and it would hit his hands and stick to it like he had stick them on it. Like big, strong hands. He's not the best route runner. It takes a little while for his routes to develop, but he's got height. He's got a little bit of speed on him and the best hands in the draft. So, I mean, you can think about those guys. Like there will be two or three, four of those guys uh, available. So I'm wondering what the fans, like when they're ranking them, what kind of receiver did they think fits with the offense? What do we need? And, and that's literally what I was getting ready to ask you because we've been talking about it on this podcast for the past couple of years what archetype of receiver we think that the Ravens need in order to kind of get over the hump offensively, at least, because we, we've we got a lot of the, uh, we've got a lot of these archetypes, right? We've got kind of like the speedy, you know, joystick 
kind of receiver in Zay Flowers had it before in like a Hollywood Brown. We've got the route uh, the route running savant and like a Rashad Bateman. This past season, we had Odo Beckham Jr. who was kind of offering that up as well. We've got the big body tight ends. We've got you know of course Mark Andrews. Uh, we've got the veteran presence in Nelson Aguilar who stepped up in, in some key moments last season. So I say all that to say, what type of receiver? Jason, do you think that the Ravens are missing here? I feel like I know where you're going to go with this. I just want to, I just want to confirm it. What type of receiver is it? Is it another yeah. shifty guy who can, who can kind of take the top off of a defense? Is it a possession guy with a bigger body? What, what, what are you thinking on that one? I'm looking for two things. I would like to have a bigger receiver to complement the group, but I also something that uh, is something that's, I think slept on is that like one of the reasons I like Keon Coleman, who is probably going to go in between when we pick and then when we pick again, is that like Boz is saying, like that bold and body type. With Keon Coleman, he's really good at finding space when the play breaks down. And think about it. What's one of Lamar's strengths is extending plays that break down. So when I'm looking at these receivers, I want to look how they look in the scramble drill. When the wide receiver or you know the offensive line breaks down, quarterbacks rolling out are they working towards the quarterback do they have that mark andrews kind of like spatial awareness to where they can get in between a few guys and and finish a catch strong so that would be two things i'm looking for a big guy and somebody that has a good brain somebody that has a good feel for the game no yeah i i, I totally agree with that and um you know and i, I kind of want to get your take on this as well let's let's talk about rashad bateman for it for a minute right um, me and Alice have kind of theorized on this show on what the issue is with not being able to get Bateman more involved in this offense. Uh, me personally, um, and I know Alex agrees with me here, Bateman is more of like an on-script, timely receiver. You know what I mean? Like he's, he, like I said, again, he's a route-running savant. So I feel like a lot of times he'll run such a great route and he'll create immediate separation against his, against his defender. And then he'll look back and the ball's not coming his way. And since he ran such a great route, he's just kind of sitting there like, okay, why is the ball not coming my way? Instead of kind of working his way back to the ball, like a Zay Flowers will do, like a Mark Andrews will do. Um, Alex, am, am I am I off the mark there or no? Okay, okay. So so Jason, I want to I want to hear from you. Um, you know, obviously you watch a lot of Rashad Bateman as well. I'm sure you've broken down his tape. Uh, what do you think is the issue with Rashad Bateman within the Ravens offense? Well, first, I want to back you up on what you said. Uh, Rashad's strength is not. He's something he's had to work on and has gotten a little bit better at is, is freestyling. Once his route is over, and you got you to gotta also think Rashad is usually lined up at X receiver on the left side. So when plays break down, Lamar's usually rolling right. So he, Rashad's got to work across the field, whereas Zay and Mark are usually – you know, in the middle or somewhere in Lamar's range. But the main thing I think is it's going to take a concerted effort because as you guys know, the X receiver is by himself. Okay. So what happened a ton last year, and I went back and restudied this and started writing down numbers, but it got too complicated and convoluted. You're going to have Mark Andrews and Zay flowers on one side. The read is going to go to them first. They're looking there and son of a gun. One of them's open. And Rashad could be running a great route on the other side. It doesn't matter. The ball's never going to get to him. And then if the Zay and Mark are covered, then there's going to be a breakdown in the offensive line. Lamar never gets a chance to go to his third read. Um, so I think it's on the coaches really to call those first reads toward Rashad Bateman. And, you know, when you're looking at a guy who gets three, four targets a game. To me, you can't pick up the option on a guy, pay him 14 million to get three or four targets. It's either, use them or lose them like Jeremiah is saying. And, and if you guys have noticed this, something that I, again, I didn't chart, but seems to be a trend. They would script in touches for Rashad Bateman early in the game and he would get them and they'd be drag routes or slant routes or whatever. And he'd be targeted, get a couple of catches in the first quarter and then disappear. Yeah. You'd never hear yeah. from him off script. So I don't know if that's Lamar calling plays, you know, or Leo, Hey, I'm getting in the groove with say, I'm getting in the groove with Mark or likely whoever's a tight end and Rashad kind of gets forgotten about, but a lot of it is he's reading the right side. He's reading the strong side where Zay flowers is and the tight end is, and he doesn't really even need to go to Bateman. One of those guys he's going to feel comfortable with and hit. Yeah. And you talk about Lamar rolling to the right. Think about Rashad Bateman's only touchdown. I know this because it happened right in front of me. Rolls out to the left. 
hits Bateman in the back of the end zone against the Bengals. It's a great point you bring up there. Um, I'm I'm a Bateman fan. Uh, I'm a truther to, to a point you could say, but I'm right there with you. Why pay somebody all this money if you're not going to, you know, what's the point of having soldiers if you're not going to use them? I'll say it. I'll bring the age-old quote back out. Uh, and then, you know, going back to the draft you brought up, Xavier Leggett, and bringing up the name DK Metcalf. The Kalen Zacharias Metcalf. That that tickled my fancy <laughs> right there. That always, that's the way to win me over, you know. It's if a girl came up to me and gave me a Kalen Zacharias Metcalf Seahawks jersey, I'm getting on one knee. I'm going to the jewelry store and I'm buying however many carrot ring you want. So <laughs> I feel like I feel like Sutton and and, and the Purple Rain uh, gang need some homework there. Xavier uh, with an X, Leggett. And you tell me what this guy is built like. Uh, I got his measurements here, but he's a shorter version of DK Metcalf. And when you look at him, Sutton, you're going to be amazed at being like a bodybuilder looking guy can be so graceful, twist and turn his body at the catch point and make it look so easy. It's it's just kind of rare. He's 6'1", 221 and ran a 439. So he okay. is stacked, bro. It's no body fat on him. 6'1", 221 of uh, pure muscle. Uh, it, it's just amazing to watch. A specimen. Uh, yeah, I'll have to definitely look into his tape, man. I mean, wow. Seems like there's going to be a lot of good options. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of great options at wide receiver, even if we do decide to uh, wait it out into you know that second round. Who knows if we trade back? Um, whatever, right? Now, I, I wanted to ask you about this as well, because I heard you speak about this on, on, on your show. And again, make sure you guys go over to Huddle It Up Film's YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe to him. He's coming out with content as well on the Ravens. Now, you talked about linebacker a little bit. I want to bring up the the kind of, uh, I don't want to say like conundrum we're in because we still got Roquan Smith holding things down. And the thought now is that we're going to have, you know, Trenton Simpson back him up, right? But do you think that with the with the loss of Patrick Queen, do you think that the the linebacking position kind of climbs up the, the hierarchy of priority uh, for this draft? Yes, sir. Or what do you think? I, I actually don't think so. I think that, Trenton Simpson, you don't draft a inside linebacker in the third round without him being a succession plan. That's kind of a high pick for an inside mm -hmm. linebacker. Um, it's not a devalued position. So Trenton Simpson was probably, I don't, I don't know, but probably like the first three linebackers off the board, four linebackers off the board. So he was a top five guy at his position last year. And another thing to consider, Sutton, is a lot of times on these third downs, Remember, we were bringing the Anthony Levines or bring Chuck Clark down into the box, play these yeah. safety looks. So having two full-time linebackers was something different for the Ravens. They they only did that once they got PQ and Roquan together. So I, I'm actually a fan of Trenton Simpson. Um, got a cut up on my channel of his you know game versus the Steelers and thought he did well. And I think what you're going to get from him is a lot of what you got say PQ 2021, 2022, where he would have some down moments, but he would make those splash plays. Uh, when it comes to running and hitting, Trenton Simpson is excellent. Uh, you know, is he going to struggle some and run defense? Maybe. Is he going to struggle in coverage a little bit? Maybe. But he'll be able to shoot the gap, make plays, and be a strong tackler. So I think if anything, Sut, I think that there's a lot of safeties in this uh, class. We don't have Geno. We don't have uh, Daryl Worley's a free agent. So I feel yeah. like we, we, we'd probably draft a strong safety. And the reasoning behind that, Alex, as you know, we got uh, Kyle Hamilton switching between strong safety and slot cornerback. So we got Millett back as a slot cornerback when Kyle's not there. We need a strong safety uh, to start mm -hmm. for us when Kyle's in the slot. Yeah. And then and also Darius Washington. I mean, he really hasn't been on the field. Bruce, what's going on, my boy? Um, yes, you know, he hasn't been on the field as much as we'd like him to, but he's now another piece shift factor in, but I'm right there with you. Um, get another safety because moving Kyle Hamilton around is just, it's as impactful as his play, you know, on the field. You know, you don't know where he is. You have to look out for number 14. We saw him make how many plays against the Niners last year, you know, at the line of scrimmage, you know, rushing, getting thrown on the ground and then going to pick the ball off. You know, it's, so I'm right there with you. You know, will we draft that guy in later rounds? Who knows? Um, there are some safeties in this draft I do like. Certain one in Maryland, I'm going to say. Um, but, you know, I, I would like us getting a safety. It, would, it may feel very comfortable because we can develop our, our, our day three guys better than some teams. So, Sut, would you push back on that and say, hey, man, we should have some kind of backup plan for Simpson and, 
and Roquan and maybe take a shot in the fourth or fifth round with a with a linebacker? To me, no, I, I wouldn't. Um, I, I mainly brought it up because I, I saw the discourse kind of going down on Twitter the other day. Like, hey, do we do we actually believe in, in Trent Simpson out of Clemson? Like, do, do we think that he's going to step up and really fill that PQ role uh, immediately? Or is he going to experience a lot of those same growing pains that PQ experienced, you know, with not being able to to cover out in space as well as he necessarily needed to uh, in, in certain scenarios? Which I think it's just going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's just going to be natural. Like, there's going to be growing pains when it comes to Trenton Simpson. And the good thing is he's going to start his career, like, starting in the NFL alongside one of the best linebackers, if not the best linebacker in the NFL, yeah. Roquan Smith. So he's going to be able to learn a lot, especially over this offseason, which is why I have faith in him. And I don't think that we should invest any draft capital, and you know, unless it's, like, way, way down, like, you know, one of the later rounds of the draft, you know, where we can just kind of get a guy for if it looks right. But listen, we got a super chat donation. This one's coming oh, from Asmodeus Thanatos. What's going on, bro? He says, uh, for your fried dumpling needs. Dumpling. Won't even let me bring him up on screen. Fried dumpling in go. a minute. Sounds good. <laughs> That's Hollandtown. Is Asmodeus from Hollandtown? That's some Hollandtown stuff right there. I know, I know what I see it. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think I've ever had fried dumplings. So oh, maybe I have to pretty, give it a shot. It's pretty good, bro. You, I wouldn't steer you wrong on that one. Uh, you eat it with other stuff. So a dumplings like a bread. So you know, you, you yeah. eat it with other stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, I do thank you so much for the donation, bro. This means from Northern Virginia. Okay. Place. Well, you got oh, some Baltimore City taste <laughs> for you, man. I, um, I want to go back to linebacker talk because I'll be honest, I'm probably the lowest out of anybody here on Trenton Simpson. I was the one okay. asking for us to take a look at Willie Gay or Devin White uh, just because I, I don't know, man. Like, at, But then you talked about when you put him next to Roquan, your life's a lot easier. But I just saw what having what having you know Queen next to uh, uh, Roquan did last year for this defense. And I was like, you know, like Willie Gay, one year three mil. But now I'm looking at that, that three mil can go somewhere else to a position that, you know, we could use as a starter and be playing more snaps than linebacker too. So I'm probably the least high here on, on Trent Simpson, but definitely promising from that week 18 game. It's very fair, Alec and Alex. And I think that if you really wanted to go high and you didn't want to go round two in round three, you could get someone like a Jeremiah Trotter jr. Who's instinctive, not a great athlete, but he's just a pure football player. Like his father, um, maybe a guy like junior Colson out of Michigan, Cedric gray from North Carolina, there are guys that you can look up that are pretty good, uh, like linebacker. I think it's a decent linebacker class, and it's headed by someone named Edrin Cooper out of Texas A&M. Um, watch Edrin Cooper versus Alabama. That's probably on YouTube. Bro, that guy has a chance mm -hmm. to be like a true – he's got true Mike linebacker qualities, which is a dying mm -hmm. breed. So when you're talking about somebody who's, may I say, a badass, he's got that. He's got sideline to sideline type range and some real chops as far as like pushing the line to scrimmage, scraping, being able to get through the whole, gets the best of contact most of the time. So Edron Cooper, Texas A&M, if he's there in round two, it would be very tempting to try to recreate the Roquan PQ uh, duo. I, I think in other drafts, he'd be like a first rounder, like where Patrick Queen, Jordan Brooks, and them went, uh, Kenneth Murray, that one draft. But in this draft stacked with, wide receivers and his offensive line, Cooper's going to be pushed back probably to round two. And now okay. as we're talking about draft, we brought, we brought up safeties. Um, I'm going to take it to day, day three, most likely, maybe day two. Uh, I want to head down the road to a college. We really don't dip our toes into that much. But that college that produces talent, the college where I saw a couple of their games this year, University of Maryland, the Turt. Mm. Got a couple of guys that are prospects. You know, not your day ones. Um, but, you know, a guy like Bo Braid, I saw, uh, I believe, Delmar Glees as well as somebody I think the Ravens met with him. So any any knowledge on those guys while we're talking about it? Absolutely. A couple of Maryland guys. Uh, Bo, Bo Braid, I really like him. He is a fearless player. He's what you want in a safety as far as uh, sometimes you got to be the nail when you play safety. Sometimes you're rushing up to the scene of the crime, so to speak, and you don't have the best angle, and you just got to kind of get in the way and get run over and be that kind of a guy like strong safety is a, a thankless job. Sometimes he has got that in him. Um, I would almost expect him to play stronger for his size at six foot two Oh three. I was kind of expecting some more booming hits from him, 
but I really admire his courage and physicality. His eyes look pure when covering bunches and stacks. So Alex, when you're talking about like a guy who could uh, masquerade in the slot some, he can do that. You can play him in off coverage. He's got great eye balance between the receivers, the quarterback. Let me look back at the receivers, the quarterback. Okay, the quarterback's getting ready to throw. Let me break. Um, Bo Braid is excellent in those kind of situations to just really read the coverage and play it. He can probably play you some tight ends, man up on them. So I really like Bo Braid as an option, say like round four or five. It's a stack safety class. So a lot of these guys are going to be graded uh, just the same. And then Delmar Glaze, I think he should be getting more love, honestly. And I don't, I don't have a Maryland bias or anything like that. So I just look at it. Just they're all prospects to me, but Glaze is a big guy. And I, I kind of like the senior bowl. Uh, I like the tape that I, that I saw. Um, I'm going to see where I have him right here on the uh, big board. I mean, I have him in the draftable category um, as somebody who's probably going to be a guard, and, but more likely to stick a tackle. I've seen Glaze go in some of these mock drafts in like round six and seven. To me, he's like a, fourth to fifth rounder all day a big old offensive lineman who's got good left tackle tape i mean yeah he's got his faults but he's a big dude could clean up his body a little bit and get a little more fit move a little faster but move him to guard or move him to right tackle and i think you really have something there with glaze yeah shout out to uh coach locks and what he does with them boys at maryland found got that bowl win this year over auburn that was a good win and um i saw some people talk about uh, Talia Tungabaloa, you know, he's probably not going to get drafted maybe day three. Um, if that, um, talk about him as a UDFA, I'm, I'm not too too big on that at all. I think we have Malik Cunningham and, and Josh Johnson. Maybe I've seen people talk about maybe Joe Milton, you know, a late day three if he's there. Um, wouldn't hate it, but uh, I, I think we do have Josh Johnson, Malik Cunningham. They'll battle it out for the number two. Um, and like I've said before, it's nice being a Ravens fan. You don't have to worry about quarterbacks. We have our guy. We don't have to sit here and watch the film and like like we were doing last year. We were a hundred percent talking about the possibility. You know, we met with Will Levis. We met with him. I was in denial. I was in denial. I said no. I am not we looking at any of these quarterbacks. <laughs> we had Jimmy G and Ravens uniform photoshops. We were in the pits of hell. That was awful. I never want to be there again. We had Derek Carr to the Ravens rivers. No. Alex, I promise you, like I've, everybody's asking me about quarterbacks. I'm like, I'm not watching them. Lamar's coming back. I don't care what you say. <laughs> like strict denial. You know what I mean? Just the blinders were on. Um, yeah. I'm like, and I'm thinking on the inside, well, if we draft one, then I'll have plenty of some all summertime to cry and, uh, and study a new guy. But like, that was, that was kind of my philosophy last year. Dude, they take so long to study. I did not want to do it. And then I love Lamar so much that I did not want to do it. So it was just a, yeah. It was a procrastination meets emotion. Like it wasn't happening. Okay. So I want to, um, before we wrap up the draft talk, right. And we get into our next topic. I want uh, Jason, I want you to give us maybe one to two sleeper sleepers in the draft, right? So some Ooh. guys that we maybe haven't talked about yet, but maybe, maybe some guys who are a little bit further down on your draft, big board, maybe some day two, day three guys that nobody's really talking about. Who are some guys that we can keep our eyes out for? That'd be good All right, the so I have on my on my big board, I have uh, players that are starred as positional favorites. And what that means, uh, just as a cheat sheet, is they're players that they're, if you look on, at them on my board, they're going to be higher than they are on other boards. Okay, so I admit that I like these players better than, like, they're going to be hanging out on the board. So one of them is a player called K named Caden Wallace from Penn State. Uh, he played right tackle for them. I think Caden Wallace, and his name is spelled C-A-E, Caden. Um, I think that he is going to be a player in the NFL. I love the way he run blocks. He's sticky. Uh, he's able to maintain his – he's got good length. I think his arms are 34 inches. And he's able to push the pile. Excellent run blocker as a right tackle. Whether he can stay at right tackle on the next level, I'm not sure. But I think he could be one of these guys that could be a starting and a plus starting right guard. You bring him in, maybe he helps you, maybe he's better than Fala Lele, and then he can take over for Ben Cleveland next year. So I like the fit. I love his tape as far as run blocking. Maybe he can't stick at right tackle. Maybe he's just a little a bit uh, not light-footed enough for that. But I really like him. The, talking about like a third, fourth-round guy, like I would take him in the third round all day, but I see him in mock drafts going like the fourth and, and things like that. Uh, another guy that I love, uh, you brought him up earlier, Sutton, is Blake Fisher out of Notre Dame. 
Mm. Now, here's the thing with Blake Fisher. He was a five-star recruit. He is a redshirt sophomore, so he's still young. He's like 20, 21 years old. He went to Notre Dame, and there was a guy playing left tackle named Joe Alt. Joe Alt's going to be a top 10 pick. So Blake Fisher's chilling over there at right tackle. People are looking at him as a right tackle prospect, and when I look at him, I see a starting left tackle. I think he's got the physical abilities. He's a five-star recruit for a reason. Sure, he was uh, playing left tackle all through high school. You know what I mean? Usually those five-star recruits are, you know, groomed from an early age or playing left tackle for a while. So Blake Fisher out of Notre Dame, I would be happy if we took him as as early as round two. And I never mm-hmm. see him get uh, mocked to the Ravens. I never see his name. I think he gets buried in like the third round range in most mocks. But I love Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. Uh, while you're watching Joe Alt and trying to find some games on YouTube, watch their right tackle, Blake Fisher. I also believe he's a, a local a local product, too. Um, I'd have to check that, double-check that. But, uh, yeah, a couple of linemen, Caden Wallace from Penn State, Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. I think that those are guys where they could slip and be right there for us and really add to our line. And and they're not the typical names we hear, like the Guytons and the Mims and the, uh, you know, the wide receivers and all that, some some hidden some hidden uh, gems there. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. I mean, I got, I had my pen and pad. I wrote those names down. Um, I was already familiar with Fisher. So I've done a little bit of research on him, but uh, I will do some research on Caden Wallace and see what he's all about. So, you know, cause I'm all about the sleepers and I think um, there's a couple of years ago. Let me know if you guys remember this name, uh, Arnold Ebicady. Mm-hmm. He is, mm-hmm. who is he with now? Is he with the Falcons still? He was drafted by them. I don't know if he's still there, but. Okay. I'm not sure where his production is at these days, but uh, back when he was coming, I think he came out of Penn State, I want to say. I loved his tape. I loved his stats, things like that. And I want to say I heard his name a couple times on broadcast last year, uh, but he was one of my sleepers from a few few seasons ago. So I love to hear people's sleepers from the draft coming up. Uh, What's up, Alex? You, You got something? What's going on? Six sacks, two forced fumbles last year. Not bad. You know what I'm saying? That's not bad. <laughs> this is why I love the sleepers. This is why I love the sleepers. You know, hey, especially from a team that couldn't score and was never ahead, by the way. So mm. exactly. Yeah, you put them Talk you put them on it. the Raven, put them on the Ravens or something. Those six sacks probably go to eight, ten. Man. Uh listen, mm. like the video, y'all, for uh for us and for our guests as well. Make sure again, I'm gonna keep saying I'm gonna keep plugging this guy. Huddle it up films on YouTube. Make sure you go ahead, subscribe to his channel. Literally just put out a video today talking about the same things we're talking about now, but more in depth, more in detail. He's talking about it with uh, Coach All 22 Films. Uh, So make sure you guys go ahead and check him out. Also, he's got his big board on his YouTube channel as well. Mm. It's like a 39 second video where he's just telling you guys that, look, here's my big board. Here's where you can find it. Make sure you guys go ahead and check out that video as well because he's got a lot of good information on that. Um, Literally, a, a whole spreadsheet with over 100 so, names on it. it it's crazy with the big boy you're gonna open it up, up excel and you're gonna favorite it so it's always there on your tab so when you first thing you do is open your tab up it's right there you're never gonna lose it keep it in your favorites yeah. and the updates on its own big board i know for one thing the cheat sheet. i'm going to have that big board up on my ipad while i'm watching yep. the draft and you guys yep. you guys know we'll be live streaming during the draft too so it's gonna be great and i'll be updating it throughout the draft so i'll be taking names off the board um wow. As we go, I do that every year. So uh, you'll better. see the names disappear. The only thing I don't do that I just don't have time for because I'll be on shows and, and stuff like that, too, is you got to keep in mind to reset that board. So, um, for instance, if we were to take a wide receiver with our first pick, then you when you see a wide receiver, you might want to be like, all right, we already got one. We should probably scoot him a little bit down. Like use your common sense a little bit when you're looking at the board as like who's been picked and who's still left. So there's two tabs on there. One is everybody mixed together in a big board, and the other is by position, their ranking. So I hope you guys enjoy that. And um, I will put it in the chat. I can't. Maybe Sutton can put the big board tag uh or maybe I'll comment on the I don't know if I could put it or you can put it in we'll, the comments or the we'll whatever. put it in the description. Description, okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll throw that in the description right after the show's over. Um, okay, so let's kind of shift gears from draft talk, right? So we're gonna we're gonna end on a uh, a more I don't want to say a, a bright note. I, I don't know what to call this, right? I didn't know how I felt about this when it initially went down earlier this week. Um, let me stop missing words. Stefan Diggs is now a Houston Texan, okay? And 
it was kind of like a uh, foregone conclusion that Stefan Diggs was not going to be in Buffalo that much longer. It was just a matter of, okay, where is he going to end up? Uh, some Ravens fans thought that he should come to Baltimore. I was never on that on that train. I was never of that school of thought. Uh, Alex, you were, you were, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, you were. I'm I a remember. big Diggs guy. Been a big Diggs guy. Um, yeah, see, I was not was I, coming out. Did... <sighs> Just down the street. You know, you, like I said, you're I'm a big what? I brought up Maryland. I'm a big Diggs big guy. Diggs? Big Diggs. Okay. D i g g s. <laughs> big Diggs. <laughs> Make Get sure. your head out the gutter. Come on now. Uh, Bro. <laughs> you know, just he, him donning that black and purple when he donned that, you know, black and red of the Terps. Yeah. I mean, good for him, you know, but the, you know, the good thing is that he'll be a free agent next year. So we're going to have the same conversation 365 days. I'll be starting up the Stefan Diggs uh, train to Baltimore once again. It'll be perfect. He'll be one year older, a vet. It's 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 perfect. Another Celtic Shack on this team. Let's get ready for it. I I mean, but like it, it seems like he's going to be one of the cornerstone pieces of that offense now. You know, uh, with Nico Collins there, with Tank Dell, and of course CJ Stroud at the helm, Joe Mixon, who they just acquired as well. That they kind of got a not kind of they definitely have a stacked team uh, over there in Houston. A bunch of guys on rookie deals, by the way. Uh, Man, the sky's the limit for them. And I made a video earlier today kind of talking about is the uh, are, are the Texans kind of like the blueprint for success in the you know, modern day NFL. And I, I kind of agree. There's there's kind of a formula that I think you have to follow uh, in order to go from zero to hero, so to speak. Uh, you got to get first of all, first step, you got to get lucky on the quarterback. I think that the Texans, they they got lucky with C.J. Stroud because if you you remember back to last year before the draft, a lot of guys were saying, oh, C.J. Stroud, he's going to be a bust. But what did he score on the Wonderlick? It wasn't that great. You know, his IQ is not there. And what, what do you know? I mean, he comes out and he puts up a fight against the Baltimore Ravens in the divisional round of the playoffs, right? Um, that game was tied at halftime, quite literally. It, he had a shot to go to the AFC Championship game in his rookie season. So I think that the first step, of course, you got to get lucky on the quarterback because we've seen guys over the years who get drafted in the top five, top 10 quarterbacks, that is, um, who are hit or miss. A lot of them are hit or miss. Even the highest, the highest rated guys, you know, don't always come in and kind of light shit up the way that you expect them to do. So, you know, you got to hit on the quarterback. That's a gamble in itself right there. But then also, as soon as you see that you have something at quarterback, like the Texans saw that, that they had with C.J. Stroud, you have to immediately – Emphasis on immediately surround him with good enough talent in order to, uh, you know, make shit happen during his rookie deal. You know, that, that that rookie contract is everything for a team because once you get into, you know, paying your quarterback $30, $40 million a year, it's not going to be easy to put the talent around him. And Tom Brady, you know, he was kind of like the model, the model kind of quarterback where he took pay cuts regularly to make sure that there was talent enough on that roster. So I think that those are the kind of like the, the first couple of steps to the formula from bringing your franchise from zero to hero. First, get lucky on the quarterback. You got to gamble a little bit. Right. Uh, and then second, immediately surround him with talent. Now, do you guys, and I'll end, I'll end with this and here's why I want to turn it over to, uh, to you, Jason and, and you, Alex as well. The bills losing Stefan Diggs. The Bills losing Gabe Davis. Do you think that there's been a transfer of power in the AFC? So the spot that the Bills had, right, where they are, you know, top three seed regularly in the AFC. Do you think that they just kind of swapped with the Texans? Is it going to be the Houston Texans now who kind of take that place? Or, you know, what do y'all think about that? I kind of say, like, simple answer would be yeah, yes, I do. Okay. I do. I, I believe in the t what the Texans' foundation on defense. Um, in you know, aside from the offensive moves, like they have a good foundation on defense too. Buffalo had a hard time on defense last year. I don't think they were the same same since those injuries uh, at the end of what would that have been twenty twenty two. They lost Poyer and Micah Hyde and uh, their linebackers and everybody started going down. Like their defense hasn't been the same really since then. Um, so yeah, like I look at other teams in the AFC East and I could see them winning that division. Whereas in the AFC South, I'd put my money on Houston right now to win that division. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's just kind of the way I see it. I, I mean, maybe we're oversimplifying it, but Texans are, we're, we're a good team. I think coming into the off season, 
with a young quarterback who's only going to get better. And they're now they're really kind of pushing uh, around him, which is great to see for him. Yeah. Alex. Yeah. And you take this to find Diggs trade away. I think they still have nailed the off season. Uh, even last year, you know, they brought in Robert Woods. They had, and they brought in Dalton Schultz this year. They re-signed Dalton Schultz. Uh, they go out and get Denise. Go Autry, uh, Daniil Hunter, Mario Edwards, and then uh, Jeff Okuda, and then CJ Henderson to, to bolster up the secondary. And then you have D'Amico Ryans, who are, you know, in his first year of coaching, takes that team to the playoffs and really had no business being there and won a playoff game, beating the Red Hot Browns, who people had, you know, people kind of wrote off the Texans. I think they're like, oh, well, Joe Vlad is going to go to Baltimore and, and play them again. But <laughs> Stroud and, and company went out there and, and put the belt to ass and whipped them. Uh, and like so, even without this digs, they they've aced the offseason, but this just is you know the cherry on top. Uh, the Texans, I'm 100. They have taken over the Bills, and the Bills right now look at their wide receiving core. That's what we were dealing with the past couple of years. You know, that's what we were dealing with signing Sammy Watkins off the street in week 14, 15, signing Deshaun Jackson, and with his corpse. You know, right. So and and I think it would be one thing, Sutton, if we could say, man, this Bills team is complete. You know, this they their all, offensive line is strong. Their defense is strong. Like, it's not. So this is a situation where you can't just plug it through the draft or try to trade for another receiver, and all of a sudden you're back to where you were. Like, I think that the Buffalo team has kind of slowly eroded a little bit overall. Mm -hmm. It's big. It's bigger. It goes deeper than than just the Diggs trade. Like, even with Diggs, I don't, I couldn't say with confidence they're one of those teams. You know. So that's just my take on it. The Von Miller signing too. It, that just they gave him a whole lot of money back in his career, and then it just Dre just brought out the Von Miller contract, left them in shambles, and they have that thirty one yeah. million dead cap with with Diggs. Uh, so at the same time, I did see Josh Allen take them to the playoffs with John Brown and Cole Beasley. So I'm not going to discredit the Bills at all because who knows what happens with the Dolphins and, and Tua and all that. But th I, they're definitely can make the uh, the playoffs with a wild card. I I will say. And I think I tweeted this earlier. Make sure you draft Dalton Kincaid in your fantasy leagues this year. That's going mm -hmm. to be a steal, an absolute steal at tight end. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get into some questions before we get out of here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with Asmodeus says, what is your favorite food? Just simply put, Ooh. favorite food. Oh, man, this is a uh, this is a tough one. See, me personally, y'all might not like my answer because I – I'm a vegetable guy, right? I, I, I love fruits okay. and vegetables. So I'm probably going to have to go spinach as my favorite food. And that, again, you might not like that answer, but I grew up, I grew up eating a lot of spinach, you know, coincidentally watching Popeye at the same time. It, it, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was great. So I'm going to go with spinach because there's just so many things you can do with it. You can eat it, you know, just raw, cooked, sauteed. Um, I love it. And of course you can pair it with a lot of different types of meals. So Give me spinach. What do y'all say? Good, simply. I love seafood. Love seafood. Lobster. I can chow down on lobster any day of the weekend, man. So, uh, probably thought I was going to say crab. It's lobster by far. Man, don't, don't take simply to the Cheesecake Factory, man. Don't take him to the Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> That's not there? good. He's high priced, man. He's high priced. <laughs> me, I'm a Which look. Word? I, I, I could eat pizza with pepperonis on it every day. And I'm also a uh, a potatoes guy. The baked potatoes, mm. mashed potatoes, tater tots, okay. hash browns, any of that. Like potatoes make me feel like uh, good. Like it feels like it's good for you. You know what I mean? Filling and it's not junky junk. I'm sure I don't know if it's fattening or what. I'm not, not a big nutrition guy, but potatoes make me feel good. Okay. Uh, I have a question for both of y'all. Both of y'all stay closer okay. to Baltimore than I do. I actually live in Southern Maryland, so about an hour and some change away. Uh, but I want to know, because I've been, I've been thinking a lot. I want to visit Baltimore a lot more over the summer, right? But I'm trying to figure out who has the best crab cake in Baltimore. Um, and this is something I've been kind of, I've been on TikTok. I've been on Google trying to figure out who's got the best one. But I want to ask you all, because you guys probably know firsthand, who's got the best crab cake in Baltimore? Best one I've had is the one my my father makes homemade. You know, it's not small, okay. not a small portion. Um, I'm not too sure. 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to. I don't really go out and eat. You know, I'm not gonna go out and eat a crab cake. You know, I like a homemade. There's certain foods like homemade over you know going out. So I'm gonna have to let that go to Jason because I'm not really be eating out, guys. Yeah, man. Look, you come up here. You gotta you gotta come right here to Dundalk. That's how we say it. All right, it's not Dundalk. <laughs> come down to Dundalk. Go to Jimmy's Seafood. They're famous. Get yourself a Jimmy's crab cake. There's also um, Costas is really nice, which is kind of in Dundalk too. It's an another really nice place. But yeah, man, if you're going to come up, I wouldn't say go for the best. Like Jimmy's, of course, is great, great food. It's going to mm -hmm. taste as good as any other crab cake that you have. So uh, right. yeah, Jimmy's. Jimmy's, man. Jimmy's. I, I might come up, dude. Hey, I might come up. Hey. Hey, man, I would love that. I would love that. Let me see. It'd be a cool Definitely Jimmy well, says Buzz. Yeah, dude, yeah, hey, you can't go wrong with that, bro. Shout out to the Doc. Black Daniel says yeah. Tun Doc. <laughs> yeah. As Muddy agrees, Jimmy's is pretty good. Um, Black Daniel says Costas, for sure. Okay. Yeah. That was the and other I place see. I mentioned, Costas, yeah. Tanja Bowman says Coco's on the east side. Okay. 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 I'll give me some recommendations here. Uh, and then let me see. K Dog has a question for you, Jason. Filetti's or Captain Harvey's? Oh, K Dog, I got bad news for you, bro. Filetti's is no longer, and my wife knew the Filetti's, went to school with them. Uh, so Filetti's, man, they would hook us up when we ordered food from there. But when you're going down Captain Harvey's for some subs, whether it's on Merritt Boulevard or down there in Logan Village Shopping Center, uh, you will get too much to eat. So you can't go wrong with the Captain Harvey's mayonnaise, fried onions. Uh, yeah, but Filetti's K Dog, bro. They yeah, they they closed up uh, after COVID, never recovered. Mm. 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 Yep, COVID. Oh, we have a former Black Dundalk Daniels. Uh, resident in Boz as well. His, his former home. Oh, okay. There you go, Boz. Hey. You know, a hey, when I was talking about the Key Bridge, I'm down here in Water's Edge, bro. So yeah, I'm right. Right in the mix, man. So I don't know what uh, part Boz was from, but yep. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. All right. Listen, you guys, we've been streaming for about an hour and 20 minutes now. We're going to go ahead and leave it here. Again, we want to give a special shout out, a huge, huge thank you to our special guest tonight, Jason from Huddle It oh, Up man. Films, who is right down here. Thank you so much for coming through and dropping so much knowledge and game on us about this year's draft. Of course, we want to have you back on. Let's just say this. We're going to put it in the air right now. We will have you back on the show, whether that be, you know, maybe another day leading up to the draft or we mentioned before the stream right after the draft. Right. So then we yeah. can do our deep dive on all the all the guys the Ravens actually did pick. Um, that is going to be it's, it's going to happen. Is going to happen. So make sure you guys stay tuned into the Purple Rain Podcast YouTube channel. But then also make sure you go over to Huddle It Up Films, his draft big board link. If you're watching, if you're part of the hashtag replay game and you're not watching live right now, thank you so much. Uh, but his draft big board will be down in the description as soon as this episode is over. So if you're watching live, you know, maybe just give it a few minutes, but it will be down in the description. You guys have to see that. It's very informative. And again, Jason, we just thank you so much, man. Man, I always have such a good time, man. I said that from the first time I came on. I was watching before I started YouTube or right around when I started YouTube. I always tuned into your show because, y'all. You know, well, it just feels like my friends. You know what I mean? It just feels like my friends sitting around Family. talking ball. So I love it, man. Yeah. Anytime you want me on the stream, Tanya, love seeing you. It's just, uh, yeah, Black Daniel, all, all the people, Jeremiah W. Osti all the time. So, um, but yeah, he uh, and Boz is from Hollabird. He can see the bridge from his window. Man, see, these oh, are the kind of happy. stories. These are the kind of stories, man. I'm telling you, that bridge was a part of people's lives. And I know it's tough uh, yeah. for people who are not here to understand, but it was just, it was just, it was wild, man. It's wild. So um, love you guys to death. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'll be back for sure. Yeah. Brother, we love you too, man. And um, yeah, man. yeah, make sure you guys like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to let my guy Alex take us out. Thank you all for coming through to this fantastic episode of the Purple Rain Podcast. The quickest hour and 24 minutes, I think that's going by in a while. Literally. <laughs> but with that being said, we appreciate and love you all. And as always, stay positive. That's negative. And never, ever, ever, even on the rainiest of days, never, ever forget to call God. This has been episode 234 of the Purple Rain Podcast. We're going to catch you guys in the next one. <laughs> <laughs>